Back with another video breakdown. Trey Scotty is with me, and it's a transfer portal edition this time. We're going to be talking about Xavier's newest edition. It's Furman wing Marcus Foster. He's about six foot four, 200 pounds. I've broken down his video. You guys have his stats from the commitment video or from the commitment story. You have the impact story talking about what he does a little bit. Trey and I have both watched a ton of film here of Marcus Foster. We're going to kind of get a little bit more in depth with some of the ways that we think he might be able to fit in at Xavier. Uh, so Trey, start us off here. What, what are we looking at today? Well, you know, I think it's important to just kind of know, you know, where he's come from and, and what he's asked to do, you know, previously. And, and you, know, you look at Furman, Obviously, former you know the Xavier staffer Jeremy Groves, the associate head coach there, and they're really, really uh, good at what they do. They run more of a Princeton style offense, uh, playing through uh, almost envision a center at the top of the key, and there's a lot of cutting uh, more so to the basket, where it's more of a four out, uh, one in approach with more of a, a five, who's more of a pick and pop sort of uh, sort of big. Whereas Xavier, as we know, they're a little bit more size of the four and the five, a lot of post-ups, uh, duck-ins, as, as we've really documented that in the past. So when you're when, when you're watching Foster, um, you can see some ways where, you know, maybe he'll replace some production that Xavier's had in the past. And then in other ways, uh, you know, he played in a, in a different offense in, in a lot of a lot of aspects. So um, seeing how everything translates, uh, it, you know, it, you can't say everything with a certainty, uh, but we can certainly take some educated guesses on on how he'll be used. And, you know, I think the first thing when, when you think of Foster um, is, you know, the first thing that came to my mind was some some Oliveri replacement uh, in, in some of those reps going to him. And so when you look at Foster, it's interesting, you know, he only shot 30% from three, this past year, but he shot 39% the previous season. So why that is, um, I, I don't know that you can say exactly, but I do think part of it is he probably went from a guy, right, who's maybe option third, you know, three or four on their team that uh, won the SoCon Conference Tournament, and they obviously beat Virginia on that buzzer beer. That was a loaded, loaded team. Then they come this year, they lose some of those guys from that team. Uh, he and J.P. McGee are kind of those two main options of who they're playing through offensively. And so he shot a lower percentage. He shot about the same amount of threes. Um, but I think part of the reason for the dip would be he's going to be more keyed in by by the opponents coming into this year, whereas maybe, uh, you know, last year he was option three or four. And then when, you know, we don't know what Xavier's roster is going to be exactly. So it's hard to predict exactly where he be, you know, where he will be in that pecking order. But at the end of the day, um, I would not expect Quincy Oliveri results. Uh, I think obviously he had an unbelievable season for Xavier, but at the same time, I do think you can look at some ways he was used throughout the season. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times when Xavier needed a three, right? Like they ran a lot of different stuff for Oliveri. And so um, they did a great job all year with him. And, you know, this was just a little baseline out of bounds uh, where they're setting the stagger screen here, right? So Oliveri, um, he's starting on the block closest to the screen um, and we see he's just receiving a, a stagger so a screen from each big and again this is just a situation where they're trying to create a three for him this was just a little set play that they ran again he's on that same block uh, on the strong side here closest to the bottom of the screen uh, this is a little set play with some misdirection where he's coming off of a, a off of a pin down here for a three. So, you know, just to keep it simple, they like to use, you know, off screens for him to, to create three-point opportunities. And when you look at Foster, he did get some of these situations for Furman. So this was Furman's first play of the game. And uh, Foster's here at the top of the screen. He's number five. Uh, all he's doing, he's feeding the, the post here in the middle of the floor. He's receiving a flare screen here for number four. He's coming off of a screen um, and, and knocking down the shot. Just like we saw with Oliveri earlier, right, they, they had a baseline out of bounds to create him a three. Here's Furman, same sort of situation. He's, uh, you know, in this situation, he's the one inbounding the ball. Uh, he throws it up. He now Foster, number five. He's towards the baseline. He's coming off of a pin down here uh, for a three as well. And so, you know, Rick, with with all that, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of, uh, of those three-point opportunities go into Foster. He didn't shoot an unbelievable percentage like I talked about this year in, in the off screen. So um, I have this stat. Uh, he was 80, 81st percentile in usage in off screen. So they went to him a lot in the off screens, but he only was 23rd or 23rd, 23rd percentile in points per possession on those off screens. And so uh, that's not super efficient 
this season, but I think a lot of that was they needed him to be that creator. Uh, they had a lot of injuries this season, Furman did, and so I think a lot of it was they became a little bit more predictable in offense than the year prior, and just he was really, really keyed on, you know, J.P. Begeese, the, you know, their other go-to player has been one of the, you know, other top commodities in the portal this season. With his injury, uh, I think we're going to see, you know, maybe some more opportunities where he's not being as keyed on at Xavier, and I think obviously they'd like to see some of those percentages and efficiencies go up. Yeah. The other thing, and you're talking about the injuries is Marcus Foster dealt with an injury that held him out of the season for about a month. And when he got back around January, uh, talking to some of the guys there, they felt like that was part of his shooting issues. And not that there's any health concerns going forward. He is healthy. Now he's ready to go. He played the last half of the year was completely fine, but you know how it is. Sometimes you just, something's nagging you a little bit, or you, you had some time off, you come back and you're in a bit of a rut with your shot and he just couldn't get it dialed back in in time to get his percentage back up. Right. And there's just such a thing as game rhythm. You know, you, you're out for that long. Uh, it, it's hard, you know, the, the speed of the game to, to not get those game reps and things like that. You don't just come back and you're instantly ready to go with the flow. And so, um, yeah, he never really did get back on track uh, to, to the, those pre-injury numbers and things like that. So it's like – think- But ahead. to that point, their, their staff was still running play after play – to get him free for open shots, and he was taking seven three-pointers per game. So clearly they still felt like he was their top three-point threat. Right, and to be 81st uh, in percent time used in the off-screens in the country goes to exactly your point. They felt like that was something that they had to do, right, to ultimately produce points. So that's why Oliveri, I think, is going to be somebody to look to. Maybe you'll see some of those same sets and variations for, for Foster next season. Um, and, you know, I think a big part of Xavier's season is going to come down to ultimately what percentage. So it's like, okay, 39% last year, good percentage free injury. Now you go up a, le- you know, go up a level with, with more length and athleticism. Uh, only time will tell exactly what those numbers will shake out to be. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, what else did you like about Mark, Ma- Marcus Foster or things to look at here? Um, so next thing I liked with him was, uh, you know, the post-ups and, uh, you know, Xavier does like to post their guards and, and uh, we saw this, you know, this past year with Claude and we're going to start off with a couple clips from the, the Georgetown game. And you'll see here, uh, Claude has Rowan Brumbaugh on him. And this is just a guy that at this point in the game, right? Xavier full screen there. Uh, it's full screen on my right. end. Go ahead. You're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry about that. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, going to this Georgetown game with uh, Rowan Brumbaugh, um, you know, Brumbaugh is more of a skilled passing point guard, uh, doesn't have quite the size and physical ability as somebody like Claude. And so this is just a set play. And we talked about this throughout the season, Rick, but this is just our guy versus your guy. Um, our guys better going to win this one-on-one matchup. And so Claude was really effective um, in this uh, throughout the season. Foster also very strong, uh, just a lot like Claude, big shoulders, big, strong, lower body, um, very effective and comfortable posting up. You'll see here he's very physical. He's taking his time, just kind of gets to his spot um, again and kind of rises over. Also, you know, those are more of set play opportunities. Uh, they could go perimeter to post. So you see here, Claude, he's on the drive. Hence the perimeter, he gets cut off, perimeter to post. You could also call this a Barkley. Um, obviously, Villanova has become famous for this as well. If you watched Illinois this year, Marcus Damas, they, they ran that for him time and time again, especially in the tournament. And so uh, just kind of flipping your hips and playing through the post uh, is something Claude did pretty well at times. You know, Colby Jones did that well. Uh, and, you know, the previous season, Foster loves to do it. You see he's posting up in this clip all the way outside the three-point line. And so this isn't a set play for Furman. This is more of a concept that they were obviously comfortable playing through. You know, he sees a double team, still is able to kind of pivot through with his strength and score. You know, even in transition, they come down, he gets cut off, he flips his hips, right? And he's probably more of a physical driver, right, than somebody with super, super quick feet um, off the bounce. And so I expect Xavier to use him a little bit uh, in the post-up and some sets uh, given mismatches, right? Depending on lineups, let's say he could play at the, at the wing. Uh, Maybe it's somebody that feel like doesn't have as much size and physicality. And then I just think throughout the game, it's something that he's done through the flow and obviously very comfortable with through his firm and stuff. And it's obviously something Xavier's done in the past. I think it's going to be an area of strength for him, depending on the matchup in the game. Well, and one of the reasons that Xavier likes to play so fast is to get Uh, the defense in cross matches or get them into where they're not set the way they want to be set. And this is something I think Marcus can be really good at. One, he likes to get the the sprint to the three-point 
wing and, and knock down the shot in transition. But two, when he gets a mismatch, he's really good about doing exactly what you're talking about. Flipping his hips, giving, doing that Barkley, playing a little booty ball, and just backing his man down and using his strength and size to score. No doubt, because he's not a jitterbug, right? Like he's not a guy to make you miss in a phone book. Uh, you know, you're, you know, like he he's that type of guy where he needs an angle. To, to really use his body, use his strength, and get to his spots. And so, you know, he's not as quick as a guy uh, like Claude. Um, you know, he is more of a, a Colby Jones where he's not going to win the track meet uh, per se. He's looking to get an angle, put his body into you, um, you know, play off two feet in the paint. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that translates just as a whole, not only as a post-up player, but just playing off of closeouts, playing in transition um, and, and Xavier's, Xavier's offense. The, the next thing, Rick, I have is just Xavier's flow offense. Um, and so, you know, Xavier, we know they play a lot of two bigs, three guards. Uh, that's usually what they prefer to do over the last two years. We've seen some lineups with four guards, um, one big. But, you know, again, we don't know exactly what Xavier's roster is going to be. We believe at this time the primary offense is going to be with two bigs and Freeman off the four and then uh, some somebody else playing minutes at the five. And so, you know, throughout Xavier's offense, we see a lot of handoffs and ball screens here. Okay, that's a boost setting that ball screen. You, you see this a million times throughout the season. And all of very consistently made teams play, uh, pay for going under. So you see here Cam Jones, he goes under this screen for Marquette. All of very step behind. Again, he made that shot all season. Um, same sort of situation here, Gag. Okay. Guy goes over the screen but gets gets caught up. Oliveri just takes space, gets to a step back three. Again, we see these ball screens at this angle time and time again in Xavier's offense. You're going to see it very consistently, I believe. And so, and here's Foster. This was just a breakdown of a play for Furman, but it's at that same angle. And, again, I think Foster's going to need to make this shot. Um, we saw some ball screen usage out of him at Furman, uh, not crazy, crazy amounts, Rick. And so, you know, knowing exactly how many ball screens, how efficient he'll be, uh, I think he's probably going to end up using more ball screens than he did at Furman because, again, Furman played in more of a Princeton offense, a lot of handoffs, a lot of zooms a lot of cutting, a lot of flare screens, like we said, for his usage. And so I do think he's a guy that can make shots on those situations and his usage will probably go a little bit up. And that's just style of play. That's not Furman's right. Xavier's wrong. Xavier's right. Furman's wrong. That's just going to be an adjustment from him from system to system. So, Yeah, and I think that talking to people, that is one thing that is, I'm not going to say make or break, but it is going to be part of how he translates to Xavier's system in the Big East is how well will he play off of those ball screens because it is something they'll ask him to do a bit more of. Right, and you know, you think about Xavier, uh, you know, Miller's first year uh, at the helm, and one reason they were so, so good offensively, right, is in those three guard spots. You had Boom, who was one of the best shot makers in the country. And then you had uh, Colby and Kunkel, who I think are similar in this aspect, unbelievable decision makers. They, they can really pass. They can make shots. Uh, that the ball never really stuck with them. They didn't hold the ball a whole lot. And so I'm not saying Foster's that guy that is sticky with the ball, but uh, he's not that guy on film that the ball's just kind of ricocheting off his hands and he provides a ton of movement. Um, I'd say he's more like Oliveri in that standpoint where he's more hunting shots in those situations. And so um, I think if you're going to be more of a shot taker than a shot creator, which Foster, uh, he had a negative assist to turnover ratio. So, again, you got to be a shot shot taker or a shot creator. Obviously, the best players can do a little bit of both. I think he's going to be more of that shot taker, which is why you know we show some clips of Oliveri making shots in the flow. I don't think he's going to be coming off throwing left-hand lobs to guys at the rim. And, uh, you know, he's going to have to make some passes, but I don't think that's going to be his main uh, level of impact on the team is creating for others. And that's why Oliveri is probably a good comparison for him and how he'll fit in, because that wasn't really Oliveri's game either. He was very much a shot maker rather than a, a creator. Correct. Correct. Um, going on to some of my questions about him, Rick, is, you know, how exactly does the athleticism translate? Uh, I, you know, it's, it's hard to say, um, you know, I've got some clips here from doing some things well and, and the opposite. And it's like, he is not a dynamic athlete. So, you know, Furman did like to play at an above average pace. We know Xavier wants to play fast. And again, here's a clip of him just trying to turn, you know, turn the corner and uh, doesn't really get to anything. Right. And I just show this clip to show you, like, he's not some dynamic athlete athlete at the rim like he's not going to go up and dunk on you and you know double pump reverse finish and all you know things of that that we've seen with a guy like Claude um at times and so you know just seeing how that translates is going to be really interesting he is strong like we said we talked about him finishing through the post you'll see here again he just kind of bumps this guy back with his shoulder so he kind of gets his pad level lower 
puts his shoulder into number 22's chest. He moves back, pump fake, finishes through. Same sort of situation here, right? He's going to grab it. He drives. Again, he's playing off pivots, pump fakes. He's just kind of maneuvering this guy out of the way, number 15 from Mercer. Um, and so, you know, playing in the SoCon, going to the Big East, that's obviously a huge jump in athleticism, just position to position, right? The SoCon's obviously, it's a very good league. It's a very skilled league. It's a very well-coached league. Um, but at the same time, what kind of success is he going to have in the paint as a finisher? Um I don't know exactly. I think that's kind of tough to say. Maybe he becomes more of a passer playing off of two feet. Maybe that's something Xavier will look to kind of change with his game. Say when you get in the paint, play off two feet pass because he's not a guy making a lot of dynamic finishes off of one foot, getting an angle, bursting up to the rim and things of that nature. It's a lot of those post-ups. It's a lot of pivots, a lot of using his shoulders and things of that. And so it worked at times uh, in the SoCon just based on level of play. So when you go up a level and you're playing against the St. John's, right, you see some of the athletes that DePaul is starting to bring in through the portal. Uh, obviously, we saw UConn last night, you know, Purdue, you know, UConn, they're obviously the best team in the country by a large margin this season. But Purdue's driving in last night, and they don't have many answers because they weren't able to score over the top off one foot with their athletes. And UConn just kind of stayed home, played one-on-one, -on -one, they didn't have their kickouts for three. So that's obviously an extreme example, but what's it going to look like when he's going up against some of these better defensive teams in the, in the country? You know, the Big East is, is a wing league, in my opinion. There's a lot of really good wings, a lot of length, a lot of athleticism. So how he matches up is going to be really key, and maybe maybe a little bit of a change in style of play. Uh, it's going to be part of the you know his plan. You know Xavier's plan for him as he as he drives in the paint. And yeah. Then, I, that stood out to me as well watching him too is the what you see him drive a lot of times he needs to get his body into somebody he needs to kind of like lean on them to give himself an advantage he's not going to go by them he's not going to jump and score over them it's like he wants to get to a spot where he can lean on you and use his strength and then kind of work an angle he like decelerates slows down bumps you and then sort of leans one way or the other to try to flip a shot up a lot of times. Yeah, no doubt. And there's a lot of, you know, deacceleration is a great skill. That's not, it's not necessarily a, a negative thing, right? I mean, they, they talk about Luca in the NBA. They say he's got some of the best yeah. deacceleration metrics. So it's a good thing that he's able to do that and use his strength. Um, it'll just be interesting again. Like there are numbers that to predict how players will go league to league. Uh, but when, when you're talking this style of play, you, know, you can't say with certainty it's going to go one direction or the other. But it's definitely something to watch with him. Then uh, the last thing, Rick, and, and I think this is a huge reason uh, Xavier took him was was his ability to rebound the basketball. Right, just just a couple of numbers for you. You know, he was 20, uh, 24 point two uh, in defensive rebound percentage. So, you know, anytime that shot goes up, there's a 24 percent chance he's going to come up with it when he's on the defensive side of the ball. That's really, really high. Uh, that was 69th in the country this season. Xavier was only 177th as a team in defensive rebounding. So, you know, really right in the middle uh, with rebounding. I think when you look at some of Coach Miller's best teams that he's had. They've been really, really good rebounding teams. And so I think that this was a guy that felt like he could help them in this area, especially compared to last season. And you'll see here, I mean, he does rebound the ball in traffic, right? I mean, he is shoving this dude out of the way, just kind of like, hey, like that's that's his board. And this is where that physicality we talked about as a finisher, right? He's not going to go up and grab rebounds above the rim, but he is physical. He's got an ability to hold guys off and really grab the ball uh, in traffic, almost like a linebacker, man. He is he is really strong, really physical. Um, he's a guy that, uh, you know, again, to be 69th in the country in defensive rebound percentage, you know, think about all the players in the country, that's not 69th as a team, as an individual. That's really, really high. And so when, when they take a guy like Foster, I think they have a couple things in mind. Number one, they want to increase their rebounding percentage as a team, goes without saying. I think, number two, he gives you some lineup uh, versatility. So, Let's say they do go to some of those uh, one big lineup, four guards or four wings, however you want to consider it. He could be that guy that even though he's not, you know, six four, six five, he could slide down to the four a little bit and rebound depending on the matchup. You, know, you have he, he and Swain out there together. Suddenly you have two guys right at the at the three and the four position who are going to rebound really well together. And then you know if you're playing him at the three, uh, maybe it's Freeman or Hunter at the four. Uh, you know, a transfer at the five, I think you'd hope to be a really above average rebounding team. And hopefully that's a staple of who you are at points in time. So I think the rebounding is a big, you know, 
the biggest reason maybe they took him overall is, is you know, in, in addition to the, to the floor spacing, because I don't think you go into the season thinking you're going to play him 25 minutes a game at the four, but we know of the injury histories of Zach and Jerome. And obviously the, you know, you, you don't want wish injuries upon anybody. You hope those guys are out there playing. Uh, but at the same time, I think as a coaching staff in the back of your head, you've got to have contingency plans. Well, if this guy gets, if one guy gets re-injured or both are re-injured or whatever the case may be, what is our answer in those sorts of situations? And uh, I think he's a big, he's a big piece of that puzzle in, in terms of uh, just kind of playing C and D uh, in terms of their lineups. Well, and, and now you have some versatility if you need to do things like that, because with the uncertainty with Zach and Jerome and, and their health, it's like, well, okay, we want to be able to maybe slide some guys down there, but we also want those guys to be valuable players. So it's like now with Dalen Swain and Marcus Foster, you feel like you have two guys who can, make that type of switch. They can be wings. They can provide value there. But if you have to move them down to the forward spot, you know, Dalen obviously gives you something athleticism and defensive wise. And Marcus certainly does on the rebounding side of things. Now, I think that's definitely a big part of what they were thinking here. Yeah, absolutely. And like you just start thinking about it. It's like, okay, if you have Foster at the three, Swain at the four, Zach at the five in particular lineups, right? I mean, if they can find ways to be average on the boards with those lineups, now all of a sudden those teams have to guard them. And that could be a really, really tough matchup for other teams depending. I mean, you you flash back to the UConn uh, game at Xavier this year where Klingon was not playing. They had Caravan at the five. And think about the nightmare matchups that created – for Xavier, you know, obviously UConn, they didn't do that last night. That's not their option A. But if you have it at times, I think they did it for like three possessions at one point. Did they for three yeah, possessions? To make exactly. ED guard someone, yeah. I missed that. But, you know, it, just to have those options throughout the season, whether you want to go to that or maybe you have to uh, in certain situations. Um, there's, you have to win different games in different ways throughout the throughout the season. You're not just going to play. You're not going to make any, you know, make no adjustments and just do one thing the entire season, most likely, and have a ton of success. And we have seen, you know, Coach Miller and the staff make a lot of adjustments in season, depending on games and matchups. So uh, he does provide a ton of versatility just, just with his ability to rebound. Definitely. Trey, is that it? That's all I got. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Once again, another great video breakdown. It was Marcus Foster, the Furman Wing, newest addition for Xavier here in the transfer portal. We will be back as Xavier continues to navigate the transfer portal and add more guys. Trey and I will be here breaking it down. So thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks, Rick.